and welcome back to Cottage Talk. I am Russ Goldman. This is a very special episode of Cottage Talk as I am interviewing a very special person. His name is Tony Gale, former Fulham player. I'm looking forward to speaking to Tony. Tony's actually on also to talk about his new book, That's Entertainment, My Autobiography, which is being released September the 1st. So, Tony, I want to welcome you to Cottage Talk. Thank you for joining me. Now, that's a pleasure, Russ. Really looking forward to it, mate. Thank you. Okay, great. So let's get going. I definitely want to talk about your time at Fulham. So let's talk about your early years at Fulham. You were a youth player and then you came into the side. So I just want to get the supporters, their history caps on to talk about your time when you, when you first joined Fulham. Yeah, well, <clears throat> well, you go back way back when, but I was 11 years of age, actually, in the days that you used to have trials. So trials really... Just It was a little bit hit and miss with trials because if you performed on the day. But I suppose uh, I'd done well in the trials. Uh, but it wasn't really till I was around about 14 years of age that they knew they had uh, a decent player on their hands because then all the other clubs started to come in for me. The likes of Chelsea, Leeds, Queen's Park Rangers. Uh, and all started wanting to sign me on what you call associate schoolboy forms. Uh, but having started at Fulham... Uh, and it being so such a lovely club and the guys down there, the coaches and everything looking after me, I signed Associate Schoolboy Forms. And from, from then on, it was Apprentice and then uh, eventually Professional. So my, I started at Fulham when I was 11 and I left at 24, you know, after 330 wow. appearances, which uh, I loved the club. Beautiful. I still love the club. Sorry. Well, we'll talk about your love for the club coming up, but... I'm glad that you talked about your early years. One of the seasons I really want to hone in on, and I've talked to Rob and Gordon, who have been on this show several times, and they've talked about this season as being a tremendous season. If you could talk a little bit about the 1982-1983 season through your eyes, I would certainly like to hear that. And then separately, we'll talk a little bit about that Derby County match. Yeah, actually, it's interesting you mentioned those two because if they played a little bit better than we would have gone up rather than staying staying in the same division. So I apply all the portions of blame on to Robert Wilson um, in that midfield spot. And of course, Gordon Ivor Davis, who was our record goal scorer. But if he'd, um, if he'd have tried a little bit harder, Russ, he'd have got a few more goals and we'd have been up there. But no, two great players. I was, yeah. I was in a really good side. I was lucky then. I'd, I'd been through an era when I came into the side in 77 with superstars like George Best, Rodney Marsh, Bobby right. Moore, all, all those experienced pros. But those guys had all been retired or left the club then. And this side was under Malcolm McDonald, the season you're talking about, right. 82, 82, 83. And we went really close. Lost in that uh, last game against Derby, but we just had a few hiccups towards the end of that season when if we could have brought another striker in, if the chairman, the then chairman, Ernie Clay, had invested in another striker, we would have gone up without a shadow of a doubt. And, and for, for a small outlay, we'd have got big rewards for being in the then first division. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that, Tony. I do want to ask you a little bit about that Derby County match. Every time I bring this up to Rob, he just still, he cannot forget that match. I'm curious your thoughts about that match. Incredible, really. Uh, we was playing against um, Peter Taylor's Derby County at the time, and and they needed to they needed to win to stay up. We needed to win to go up, uh, put it like that. But they had an extremely experienced side against what was a very young side, Fulham, and I think they tried to kick us off the park and bully us that day. Uh, in and in effect, they did. Uh, they won. They won that game, but. The way it ended up was uh, just ridiculous. Uh, Robert got assaulted, uh, Robert Wilson that is, when yep. he was going to the left-hand side. One of the supporters ran on and kicked him and Robert went to turn and smack him, give him a give him a dig and we all had to try and stop him because uh, if he'd have done that, there'd have been a full-scale riot. But there was fences then all around the ground. But they'd opened the gates, got in and they was all ringing the pitch. And when the referee blew the whistle for what the crowd thought was the end of the game, but it wasn't. It was for a foul. Everybody ran off. 
uh, run on the pitch, sorry, and we had to run off. Right. And another one of our players got assaulted as well, Jeff Hopkins, who came in with a rip shirt and had been hit a few times coming off the pitch. But it was about, I think, to my recollection, Russ, probably four or five minutes to go. And although we needed two goals, you never know. You never know what right. might have happened. And in, in this day and age, Derby probably would have had the game taken away from them and we would have been awarded the game. It, it, it was that bad. It was it was quite frightening, actually, particularly... I was 24, but we had a few younger players than that. And uh, it was quite frightening for them, quite an ordeal. But really, we didn't lose it in that game. We, let, we lost it prior to that in the little bit of a run-up. And as I say, uh, we had two great strikers, Dean Coney and, and Gordon Davis. But we right. just needed to have one more just to give that little bit of pressure to the two of them when things weren't going right. Right. And uh, to be honest with you, Tony, I've only watched, obviously, the highlights on YouTube, and I'm still shocked about what I'm watching. And then Rob, obviously, and Gordon, they both have filled me in. And it's just, it's terrible that it ended that way. And uh, it would have probably, like you mentioned, been different if it was today. Yeah, oh, most definitely. Most definitely. And um, I spent another season at West at Fulham after that, before yep. I went to Bam. But it was a shame because that Fulham side was probably as good as the West Ham side that I joined. So that wouldn't have had much problem staying up in the first division, I feel, because it was a side probably more suited to first division football, or Premier League, as they call it now, than right. it was to Division 2 football, or Championship, as they call it now. So that little bit of time in history could have changed the whole fortunes of the football club. You know, it's, a, it's it, every football club will have a story. And that was Fulham's story in that particular era. Okay, excellent. I now want to just talk a little bit about your time after Fulham. You mentioned West Ham with a couple other clubs from then on. You stayed at Fulham for another season, then you moved on. Why did you move on from Fulham? Well, I stayed at Fulham for another season. And, and then, really, I'd seen a couple of generations of players and turnovers of players happen at Fulham. And at 24, I was... I think the lads will probably agree. I was one of the better players in the team. And if, you know, if, if there was uh, a transfer to be had, it would probably have been me or a couple of the other boys. Um, and Fulham needed the money and, and they didn't really offer me a contract come the end of the season after that until it got to the stage where, oops, oh, your contract's up. Now we're going to offer you a contract, you know. Right. And it went to what you call an independent tribunal. I had the choice of going to West Ham or Chelsea. Uh, I chose West Ham, went to an independent tribunal. The fee was decided. But uh, Fulham then had kind of missed the boat the season before. And then we're in that little bit of a period. Malcolm had left as well. Ray Harper had taken over. Even younger guys were going, coming into the team. And I was thinking, moment lost. And if I don't take this chance now at 24 years of age to play in the first division, the top league, then I'm really not going to have one. So I took the decision to go. It broke my heart, really. Uh, but I'd outgrown the football club. And uh, that was the bare facts of it all. And after that, myself leaving. Uh, Ray Houghton left the season after. Paul Parker as well. And in the end, Fulham were selling all their best players just to survive. So it, I probably chose the right time to go, if I was honest. Probably. Tony, very good stuff. Before we move on and we talk about other things in your career, I want to talk about something that I was sent to me from one of your former teammates, Rob Wilson. He had a couple of things he wanted me to ask you. So I'm going to read this and then uh, feel free to share your thoughts on it. This is what Rob sent me, Rob Wilson. He said that uh, you and Strongy were big tricksters. So this is this is what he said. He said that, uh, ask him about the time they peeled off the back of the magnet numbers on an attic board when Malcolm went to put one in a formation we all cheered. It went on for a few before Malcolm knew what was going on, that it was you and Strongy. Yeah, as you know, uh, everybody knows, there's these formation balls, Russ, you know, <laughs> in, the, in the changing room. So before you put them onto the board, there was a little tray where all the magnetic counters were at the bottom. Right. So Les and I thought, 
okay, this will be great. We'll take all the magnets off the back of the counters. Every time he goes to put one up, they're all going to fall off, you know, and he's going to get the ump of it. So he went out the room and he said, right, we're playing against Leeds tomorrow. They're playing a 4-4-2. And he went, right, they've got David Harvey in goal. Put the counter up and it dropped down. And we, did, we, we told all the lads, as soon as it dropped down, all go, Ree! So it went like that, and it went, Ree! like that. We said, oh, forget David Harvey. At right back, they've got Brian Greenoff. He put the counter up, bang, it fell down. Ree! Ree! After about six goes, Malcolm had a look at all the counters, and we'd taken all the magnets off the counter. And he'd got, Gailey, strongy! Ah! He's gone like that. He said, forget the tactics, 4-4-2, four, four, get out of the room, come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a great story. Thank you for sharing that, Tony. I really appreciate it. That's right. pretty funny. Sounds like you and Wes Strine had a good time at form together. Yeah, Les, he's a, a good friend of mine. I recently went to his uh, birthday party, and uh, he st we still share the same old jokes. We bore everyone rigid, I think, Russ. But... Uh, Whenever you're in, your, you're in his company, you're sure to have a good time. He works as an ambassador on match day at the at, uh, the Fulham ground now at Craven Cottage with right. Gordon. And uh, they couldn't, to be honest, with Gordon Davis, sorry, they couldn't have two better ambassadors. They're smashing blokes and all the fans love them. You've got the record goal scorer. Yep. And you've probably got one of the funniest players they've had at Fulham <laughs> after me. <laughs> He's in, the, he's in there as well. So they're, they're in great hands, the football club, with them two guys in. Okay, Rob has one more for you, Tony. He says, ask him about the yellow Capri you drove. Oh, it was the absolute nuts. Oh, it was brilliant. The nuts, sorry, the nuts means it's really, it was a really great car. It was a 1.6 gear, Russ. I bought it. Uh, it was a yellow, a yellow car, like a sports car. You saw it all the detective series yep. and all that on the telly they all had them and I wanted one so I got one of them had a black wind, wind down sunroof and uh, my mother-in-law at the time she worked in a, a, tea, a telephone company yes a telephone company where you had to pick up the phone in your car select the the code the colour code and the number you pass the message to the switchboard the switchboard then passes the message to someone on the other end on the phone so I had that, I had everything in it and it was that absolute nuts. And I was showing all the lads it and everything. It was great, you know, going up and down. Who wants a ride? Who wants a ride? So I drove it to the training ground first day, first day in Capri. And it was down at uh, the Bank of England sports ground in Richmond, uh, Roehampton. So drive there, lovely drive down there. Got the sunroof down, the windows down, looking there around, hoping everybody's recognising me, thinking I'm Billy big time. Do you know what I mean? Do training, come out. And as you come out the gates at Roehampton, it was a dead end on your right. So no traffic came from there normally. And the other side, you just had to have a look. So, of course, I've had a look the other side. And what happens? The car comes out. I've hit the car, smashed the car right into the side. Oh, no. First day, full Capri, smashed the car, smashed the other car. The two geezers got out of the car and they were <laughs> two police cadets. Would you believe it? Oh, how's your luck? First day of the full Capri, smash into two policemen. Bang out of luck, wouldn't I? Yeah. Wow. And that's, that's probably the story that Robert remembers. Yeah. Like, it, broke, it broke my heart. I was devastated, but the lads couldn't <laughs> stop laughing. Yeah. <sighs> Very good. Thank you for these stories. I'm sure Rob will appreciate once he hears that story there, Tony. Okay. Now let's move on. After your playing career, you uh, became a commentator with the Premier League. And I listen to you all the time. I know your voice. It's a signature voice. I enjoy your commentary. I like people that actually really tell it like it is. You do that, Tony. So I, I want before we talk about when you do – commentate on full matches. I just want to talk about in general, how do you feel about being a commentator on these Premier League matches? Do you enjoy it? You must. Well, I love it. I mean, I retired um, in, actually started commentating in about 97, 98. Uh, so wind all the years down now. Seven years I spent at Capital Gold Radio uh, with a great Jonathan Pierce, who you might, you might know on the radio. Yep. Uh, Airwaves, but he now works on BBC Match of the Day. So seven years there. And the rest of the time, 20 odd years, I've been working at um, Sky. So I've been commentating on live games 
since then, Russ. So the live games, I'm, I'm lucky as a radio commentator, I commentate them every major final. League Cup, FA Cup, Cup Winners Cup, uh, Fairs Cup, uh, European Cup, World Cup, European Championship, Super Cup, even the Amateur Cup final, the four playoff finals. And I did that for seven years. So I covered every game. And now coupled up with the company that uh, Sky, working for Sky and Premier League Productions, which send it around the world, which is pro- probably where you've heard it from. Right. I've been working on that. So when I started the other day, totting it up, how many games, how many games, live games have I done? I know I've played 730 games in my football career, but it was over 2,000 live games that I've been wow. to. 2,000. And you know what? I still got the same enthusiasm now as I had for the first one because football's a bug and it's a drug. It's a drug as well. It's just, it's lovely. You know, there's nothing better. I was at Fulham against Brentford at the weekend, commentating oh. on the game. And although Fulham lost, it shouldn't yep. have been a penalty. Right. They gave away the first goal. Of course, I felt sorry for Fulham, but it's still a pleasure. And going to Craven Cottage now with that new stand. Oh, and I'm commentating up in that position, Russ. Yep. Right at the back of that new stand. And as I'm looking out, I never thought I'd see the day, but I'm looking out over the Stevenage Road, or Johnny Haynes stand, as it's now called, right. and I can see the whole of West London. Skyline view. So in the daytime, it looks beautiful. In the nighttime, when it's lit up, it's absolutely stunning, mate. Absolutely stunning. There's no better ground than Fulham to do a commentary from. And Oh, that's great. Uh, but we could have done with a better result, though, couldn't we? <laughs> absolutely, Tony. Absolutely. It was actually a very disappointing way to uh, have a first home match at Craven College. But I, I want to ask you about this because I'm curious as someone that obviously I do a radio show. And you have to be impartial when you do these matches. How hard is it when you do a full match to stay impartial? you got to keep your – take your full hat off, but – it's hard. You know, you do a very good job when you do full matches. You stay impartial. I want to give you credit for that. But I want to know just as a person, how hard is it to do? It's really difficult. Fulham, West Ham and uh, Blackburn Rovers. Where yeah. was as well. And when you're going to do your the clubs that you play for, it, it's really difficult because afterwards, after the game at Fulham, I'll go into the cottage and see the directors and have a glass of wine before I go back, before I'm driven back, I might add. But... Uh, <laughs> I'll go in there with Strongy and Gordon Davis. So you're meeting all the guys behind the scenes at Fulham. It's the same at West Ham, same at Blackburn. And, you know, you just, you feel for the club when they lose or they don't, they, they don't win the game when they should have won the game. But impartiality is probably the hardest thing to have. And I've probably been accused at times of being too hard on my own teams rather than the opposition team. I but would say maybe. <laughs> people just think in that because it's their club. Because right. when I talk to people from another club, they go, oh, why don't you like us at Chelsea? Oh, why don't you like us at <laughs> Arsenal? And I'm going, I'm only saying what you're saying, but I'm not a fan. You are. Right. I'm just saying and seeing what I say, you know? No, listen, honestly, Tony, I know I'm, I'm joking around with you, but you do a really no. good job. And I actually really appreciate when – you tell it like it is. Like when Fulham are playing well, you're going to say it. When they have issues, you're going to say it. You're not going to hold back. And I actually really appreciate that. I don't want someone that's just going to sugarcoat something. You don't do that. So that's something that I, I think that all commentators should be doing, Tony. It's just tell it like it is. Tell it like you're seeing it. Don't try to play to the audience. I think you do a good job of that. It, it's difficult when you can see something that's blatantly obvious, but you don't want to be overcritical to players. It's like with uh, Mitrovic gone at the moment. Uh, obviously, got, we got Raul Jimenez yep. playing there, but Raul Jimenez is no Mitrovic. Uh, and Vinicius, when he was replacing Mitrovic last season, he's no Mitrovic either. So Fulham have downgraded in that striking department. But I think, uh, you know, I'd back Fulham now to go in the transfer market and they'll probably use the best part of that 46 million they got for Mitrovic to go and get a striker, which isn't easy. You know, I think... If anything, he was worth yeah. worth more than that, Mitrovic, probably around the 80 mark. So going over to the Saudi there, that's I think what I got think. A little, bit, a little bit of a bargain because top class strikers are a, a real premium. They really are. And for Fulham to replace like for like, it will probably cost them more. But 
when you say you're talking about that, you know, you're talking about, you have to be honest. Real Jimenez is not another Mitrovic and nor is Vinicius. So you have no. to say, Fulham have got to find another way. Other players have got to do different things to make it work for the striker who's not quite as good. You see, it was the same when Dean Coney or Gordon Davis was out of touch or we'd sold them on. We had to find another way. And that's what Fulham have got to do at the moment. But the way the club's run, superbly run, and uh, and managed by the manager, who's um, Marco Silva, has done a brilliant job. I'll back them to do that. They're playing some lovely football. I'll go all over the Premier League. Fulham play some good stuff, believe you me. Well, that's funny. Since we're talking about Fulham now, you brought up Mitrovic. I want to get your thoughts on this because you watched the match and uh, I do a podcast. And one of the things I keep getting asked is, uh, will Fulham look different without Mitrovic? And I said, yes, they're going to look different. You've already talked about that. But there are different side, Tony. I want to talk about this because I think Fulham are going to be fine once they get the recruitment right. But they've been missing a huge player, and that's Sha pulling. I want you to talk a little bit about this because I think it's a gaping hole when he doesn't play, Tony. I want your thoughts on that. Well, Pauline is a top-class player, top-class player. You know, if you look at the central midfield players of his position, like Caicedo, uh, Fernandez at Chelsea, and Declan Rice, who've all gone in excess of £100 million, I wouldn't put him far beyond the, uh, behind them. You know, and I think that, that some of those players, they've, they've been paid... They paid over the top four. So if Palinia was on the transfer market now, maybe he's a little bit older than them, around the 27 uh, years of age mark. But if he was on the same age mark, I would say he's worth as much because he's that good. Palinia is that good. I mean, the way he shields the back four is a dream for central defenders. He competes in the air, both defensively and attackingly. And his distribution is improving and the Marco Silva was a little bit erratic at the start, I thought, because his first touch wasn't as, it, as good as it should be. But given the different options that he sees forward now, if we can get better, Fulham can get better players in, yep. then I think that'll improve Palinia as well. Now, I don't think they can sell him. And if they was putting him on the market, he'd be, I think the bids were around 40 or 50. He'd be far oh. in excess of that, far in excess. Totally agree. And, Tony, I'm on the mindset, you know, and again, the speculation is that Fulham would want 90 for him. And I would say go even higher because they can't replace him. Similar to the situation, it's a little bit different with Mitro. I think they can find a striker. It won't be at Mitro's level, but I think Pauli is one that I don't think you can replace. So the player is a lot more important than the money itself. Yeah, I think so. And I think they're lucky that they're not lucky. They've done good business, actually, because they signed him on a five-year deal. So right. I think He's got four years of the contract to run, so he can't move anyway. If it was down to two years, then you might have a little bit of a problem and the club might have to cash in. But they've certainly got him for this season, I would understand. And, you know, they've got a, a top... He's one of the reasons that Fulham won't be in trouble because he's, a, you know, he's top draw. Top draw exactly. Player. I keep telling people that wait till you get a healthy Paul in your back and then you're going to see a different form and hopefully... We'll see that against Arsenal. Okay, one last thing before we talk about the book. I want to talk about something that I look forward to every single time you write, and that's your column on the Fulham website. I love your column on the Fulham website. Talk about writing about Fulham and what you get out of that. Yeah, I love I love writing about Fulham. It's uh, I do it with Jeff down at Fulham and uh, Carmelo, who's in charge of the media there. Again, people don't see behind the scenes, but the Fulham media side is top draw. And not only, not only are they really good and top draw, but they've got a good personal side to their media side as well. Really good, you know, and whenever Jeff rings me up to do the website, I think he alternates with another couple of players, doesn't he? Yep. Uh, then it's always a pleasure to do it because, you know, I'm doing the Premier League so much that I see all the other teams anyway, so I can always gauge Fulham against other teams. And if the fans think, ah, oh, Fulham's not playing this, they're not doing that, well, just look at some of the other teams, Russ. I mean, there are yep. there are teams in a real mess, I'm telling you. Fulham's in, in a good place at the moment. Uh, be in a better place when they get a striker, but they're in a good place. <laughs> totally agree with you, Tony. You're you're preaching to, to the uh, choir here because I totally uh, agree with you on that. Okay, coming up next to end this interview, I'm going to ask Tony a little bit about his book. 
Okay, Tony, to end the interview, one of the reasons why, obviously, we're having you on the show is to talk about your book, That's Entertainment. So tell our audience a little bit about it and how that they can find the book. Right. Uh, they can find it. They can get it on Amazon. They can pre-order it in Amazon, on Amazon. Or you'll get it in all good bookstores, and that's from September the 1st. Uh, I think I'm doing my first book signing at Waterstones in Lakeside on September the 1st. So if they have a look around, they'll be able to see where I'm going to do the signings in East London or West London or wherever they're going to be. But the book was a pleasure. It came about, I never wanted to write a book when I was a player because you can't say anything, can you? You know, everybody's <laughs> still in the game and it's everybody's got feelings and you're going to hurt feelings. And hopefully I haven't hurt any feelings with the book, actually. I don't think I have. <laughs> Apart from Malcolm and his magnets, I think I've hurt a few feelings there. <laughs> but... Um, of, it, it basically starts, Russ, so it goes through the stages of my life, which has been, football has been my life. So it started at school, goes through my school days, and uh, days at early uh, stages of Fulham from 11 to sign an apprentice, professional, the golden era of George Best, Bobby Moore, Rodney Marsh, the era after that of Ray Houghton, Paul Parker, Robert Wilson, Gordon Davis, Ray Lewington, Roger Brown, all those guys. So everything I did at Fulham, when I get transferred to West Ham, it's the 10 years, lovely years I had at West Ham, the great players I played with there. And then it finishes at West Ham when I go to Blackburn and I think my career's over. And then all of a sudden I go to Blackburn and I end up winning the Premier League, which is something that you might think you're going to win at the start, but you win at the end. And then you think your career's over again because I broke my ankle when I transferred to Palace. Uh, I only played three games because of a broken ankle. I had to retire and you think, what am I going to do now? So then it goes into the next phase of the book, seven years on Capital Radio. The next phase in the book, 20 years at Sky and PLP and Channel 5 and TV. And then another phase of the book where I was a non-league chairman for 17 years, which I've recently rel relinquished a couple of years ago. And um, and basically where I'm at now, still doing commentaries and uh, started up doing these fishing. Uh, never fished before in my life, but a friend of mine, Stuart Lawson, bought a fishing company and I'm doing these fishing shows with football friends, believe it or not. Paul That's Parker, great. Frank McAvenny and Paul Walsh. So it's been a wonderful life. Lucky, lucky life, charmed life to be still working in football at my age, but it basically is the tower of my life. But what's different, I think, from the other books is there's loads of funnies in it because that's why I've called, or they, in fact, they read it and I said, I don't know what to call it. And they went, that's entertainment. And I thought, that'll do for me. That, that'll do for me. Bit of Paul Weller. That's entertainment. I'm a big fan, by the way, Paul Weller. <laughs> I, I thought of that right away. <laughs> Yeah, but it's brilliant. It's brilliant. So the book, I mean, the record's brilliant, not my book. But uh, it's uh, it'll be interesting to see how people find it. That's all. But it's me. Mm. Okay. Well, I look forward to reading it myself, and I would highly recommend everyone getting a copy of the book. And and Tony already told you how you can get the book. So, Tony, listen, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about the book, talk about your time at Fulham. I really appreciate it. No, I appreciate, the, I appreciate coming on as well. And uh, if any Fulham fans out there are listening or going to listen, look, guys, have a cracking season. Enjoy it down there. These are the good times. We've had plenty of bad. These are the good times. You've got a lovely stadium on the horizon, that beautiful new stand over there, and it's onwards and upwards for Fulham. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tony. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of College Talk. My name is Russ Coleman. Thank you as always for watching and listening to Cutters Talk, part of the Talk Sport Fan Network.